my name is Angela Baldry. I'm the director at the Franklin County Law Library. I've been a county law librarian since 2001. Um, I am here with my friend and author, Libby Fisher Hellman. Libby and I met in 2012 when we traveled to Cuba together, um, which was very exciting. And since then, I think we've traveled to about four times. Four. four times. I think like 11 or 12 different countries. Um, so one of those trips was last year, 2019. We left for what I think was the trip of a lifetime. Um, it was definitely the biggest trip I've taken. Uh, almost four weeks in Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, and then a little stopover in South Korea. And as a result of that trip, Libby has written her newest novel, A Bend in the River, which is wonderful. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk politics, um, history, current events, all kinds of goodies. Yeah. So welcome. <laughs> welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm happy to be here with my friend Angela, to whom this book is dedicated, by the oh, way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So my first question to you, um, my first few questions are not necessarily going to be about the book. They're going to be about the experience overall. So it's no secret which side of the political spectrum you and I fall on. Uh, anyone who follows us on Facebook or has ever had a conversation with us knows that we tend to fall a little to the left. Um, when we landed in Hanoi, and I believe it was February 27th, 8th. 28th. Okay, 28th. It was 24 hour flight, so I'm not really sure. Um, current events were playing out all around us. Um, Trump and Kim Jong un were in Hanoi when we landed, um, getting ready for their big meeting. Um, the hotel that we stayed at, the first hotel we stayed at in Hanoi, was actually over the water, over the lake where Senator McCain had been shot down. And we found a small memorial to him down the street from our hotel later on the trip. And in one of the funniest things to ever happen to me on a trip, we were getting ready, we were getting our tickets to tour the Hanoi Hilton, and we were interrupted by the Kim Jong Un motorcade after the meeting had crashed and burned, basically. And in fact, as we stood there and watched the motorcade, we have video of him waving out of his limo window. So speak to me about how current events and history collided for you on this trip. It was, uh, it, you got a perfect um, <laughs> description because I had come to Vietnam to explore the past. I mean, my whole, my whole reason for going to Vietnam was that, you know, I was sentient and actually an, a, a, a young adult when the Vietnam War was going on. And I had friends who were drafted and other friends who enlisted and other friends who ran away. Uh, so they wouldn't be drafted. And it was the defining characteristic of my young adult life or my college life, let's put it that way. Um, and it, it was so much part of my fiber as a very young, as a young person that I wanted to go to Vietnam to see what the country was like and what kind of a place was it that, that could take the lives of 50,000 of our young men. Of course, that was pre-pandemic. Um, <laughs> At that point, you know, I think it would had been the largest number of people, except for World War II, who had been, um, who'd been take, whose lives had been taken. So the differences between what I had hoped to do and what I was looking at when that chubby little hand came out, and I'll try to find the, the shot, <laughs> throw, it, throw it in here, um, came out and started to wave, were profound. I mean... It, and they were not just profound because, you know, the, the present was colliding with the past. It was also profound because of the issues involved. I mean, Ho Chi Minh, for whatever you're going to say about him, and we're going to probably say a lot about him, 
was fighting for the for his country. He was fighting basically. He wanted to reunify uh, Vietnam, and he wanted it to be a communist country. Um, we, on the other hand, didn't want it to be a communist mm -hmm. uh, communist country at all, and didn't really care much about um, reunif reunifying the country. Uh, the meeting between Trump and King Jong Un was all show. There was nothing, nothing of any substance that was going to be discussed. And we all knew it. And so did they. I mean, this was just a spectacle, you know, where, where King Jong Un can, could get pictures of himself shaking the hands of the American president and vice versa. And, you know, we knew from the very beginning nothing was going to come from it, and then nothing did. So you compare the pageantry and the superficiality of that, you know, co uh, conference or meeting with the life, you know, where your life is at stake consequences of what I had come to Vietnam to explore. And um, it was just, it was something I just really couldn't handle very well. And on top of it happening right when we went into the Hanoi Hilton and saw what had happened in some, uh, to people during the war, it was tough. That was mm -hmm. tough. It was a tough morning and it was our only our first. Right, and I feel bad because it was my impression that the people of Hanoi did not think it was going to be for show. They had gone out of their way to decorate the city, do you remember the flowers and the banners? And I think they truly thought they were going to be on par with the Paris Accords or um, the Dayton Accord. You know, they were going to be remembered as the city that brought these two superpowers right. together. And unfortunately, by the next day, we saw all of that pageantry coming down. Um, it didn't. It didn't last very long. Exactly. It was just a waste, a waste, yeah. of money, a waste of time, a waste of everything else. And you're right. The North, v I think the North Viet uh, Vietnam, <laughs> the, oh, the, uh, wanted it to be uh, more than it was. So, yeah. Anyway. Well, speaking of of uh, Ho Chi Minh, so we had a lot of conversations with the other people on our tour and amongst ourselves that several of our stops were required possibly by the country of Vietnam. Um, one of the strangest stops that we had very early on uh, was to view Ho Chi Minh's body. Um, he's been dead since 1969. And every year he, has, he is sent back to Russia to the people who maintain Lenin's body, Lenin's corpse, and re-embalmed and re washed and remake up and whatever goes into that whole thing um but we kind of felt this was one of our required stops we we weren't really able to get out of this viewing um most of us weren't really interested in this stop but it was amazing to see the number of vietnamese people that were there lined up um having it look like picnic lunches on the big lawn before or after it was a big family event um so absolute leaders are scary um and it's a scary reality in many countries currently there's much talk here of the possibility of trump not leaving office if he's um defeated he's already laying the groundwork for fraud or voter misconduct however you want to say it you wrote an amazing book years ago a bitter veil about a woman who gets stuck in iran during the time of the shah mm -hmm. um what was your takeaway from visiting the ho chi minh mausoleum <laughs> you know um i didn't have an issue with it too much okay you know i was really glad afterwards i was really glad we had gone because okay. It does show what uh, uh, a people can um, do to honor what what they think is honoring uh, the nation, their George Washington, and 
for whatever reasons, I, I do want to talk about Ho Chi Minh for a little bit because um, he was a really interesting character. And if we had more, if we had had more time, I would have liked to have have uh, known more about him. But he was um, he was a consistent communist. He discovered communism in his twenties, and that was the nineteen twenties, um, and although they, he was persecuted by the French for it and um, probably by others to make the Japanese during the occupation, um, he never relinquished it. He never, um, never changed. Um, he, to the day he died, he was a committed communist. Um, at the same time, and this, this seems like a contradiction and it could have been, he also admired the United States. He admired America, and that's because when he was growing up, FDR was anti-colonialism, and he was very he was very interested that he that he was, and he had actually spent time in the U.S. when he was a young man. When he was finished with school, he took himself around the world, and he did odd jobs. Odd jobs. He 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 sailed around the world. World, and he was in France, and he spent time in the UK, and then he spent time in the US, and he he took a job in Boston. I think he he was working for a ship. Mm -hmm. Might have uh, been been a cab driver, not a cab driver, but um, you know, a hack. He he was talking, working in a restaurant. Was working. Um, so it's surprising. Um, he admired the US. He. And and what someone said in response to that is you have to remember that at that time, uh, before World War II or right after, the U.S. was considered the revolutionary underdog. I mean, we were the ones who had bucked the U.K. and the U.K. was, you know, just realizing that they weren't, what did they used to say, the, the sun never sets on the British Empire. I think they were just beginning to realize that that wasn't going to be the case anymore. Um, so, you know, the country, our country's narrative was resistance to a foreign, what we saw as a foreign tyrant. So I don't know if many people know this, but Ho Chi Minh wrote a letter right after World War II to um, Harry Truman. And he said, I really admire your country. I really admire um, what you've done in the world. And it was on the occasion of a uh, uh, United Nations, some kind of United Nations um, event, and he was asking for the American help to um, oh. get the, the French out of Vietnam. Okay. Um, the United States ignored him, never wrote a letter back. Um, and after that, it, Harry Truman later authorized financial and military assistance to the French in 1950. Oh. Um, and so that was that. Um, he had also, interestingly, written a letter to Woodrow Wilson under similar circumstances right after World War I, asking the same thing, saying, can you help us get the French out? Because we, I really admire your country. You are a revolutionary. You don't want foreign tyrants. And he was ignored then, too. So um, he, um, he isn't, you know, he was a dictator. Yes, he was a dictator. But... He is known for being a sort of more benevolent dictator. He did not really relish violence, although he came to accept it. And mm -hmm. I wonder if it was General Gap, his comrade in arms, who was saying there is no way that we cannot have violence, and Ho Chi Minh reluctantly agreed. I mean, I'm, I'm. He did after a while. He um, during the Vietnam War. He well, he died in '69 in the in the worst of it. But he did take a step backwards uh, during the war, and he um, I, I think he was having heart trouble then, and he let other people run things. So he's a fascinating character. Uh, I wish we had more time. Had had more time. We did go to his one of his homes. Mm -hmm or something like that in the in a park and that was really right yeah. yeah yeah um i i don't see him in quite the same way that i would see um fidel castro because i don't think he was predisposed to to kill everyone and imprison everyone who didn't agree with him 
Um, he had he had survived so many years with a divided country. He um, I don't know. I, I <laughs> want to give him a break, and I probably shouldn't, but <laughs> I kind of want to find out more about what made him tick. Okay. Well, one of the other required visits on our trip was to the War Remnant Museum in Hanoi. Um, to me, that just screamed of alternative facts. But <laughs> it's not my museum, it's their museum. Um, there was much attention paid to Agent Orange. There were graphic disturbing <laughs> videos of um, children especially who had been affected by Agent Orange. I think last week, the uh, Vietnam Memorial in DC was actually surrounded by orange candles to acknowledge the lingering effects of Agent Orange. I'm not sure if we've ever done that before. I thought I had read in the article that this was the first time that we had done that, but I could be wrong about that. Um, so in this era of fake news, how did that museum affect you? Well, it was clearly propaganda. You know, it was all propaganda. And, but here's the thing, they had the receipts, because if you remember, at least I, I remember, they stayed away from military. They, they there weren't a lot of military photos of, of the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong, their activities, it was all civilians. And it was all okay. civilians had been, had been, um, um, you know, mutilated by Agent Orange or maybe Napalm too. So. Um, as you said, it was their museum. Um, right. it, it was harrowing to see what could happen. Um, but I, you know, had to keep in mind, this is propaganda. This is what they wanted us to see. They wanted, and this is what they want their people to see. They, they want their people to realize that the United States is an imperialist pig. You know, um, that's, that's what they wanted. Um, and of course, never once did they get into any of the violence or any of the cruelty of the Viet Cong or even the North Vietnamese army. So.